Hello everyone. A man complains to his friend. My house doesn't get enough sunlight. The friend asks him, Do you get sunshine in your garden? Yes, he says. Actually, we have plenty of sunshine out there. Oh, that is your solution, says the friend. Move your house into your garden. Friends, if you are missing out on God's grace, then let us follow today's second reading and turn to Christ in faith, because the grace of God is dispensed only through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the fourth and last week we study the last chapters of the letter to the Hebrews. Let me first sum up what we have learned so far. The letter is written to encourage Jewish Christians who are being persecuted and perhaps are contemplating to give up their faith. The writer admonishes them to accept suffering in order to preserve their faith and suggest ways to make the necessary commitment. First, he defines true faith in God. He says, Faith is the realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. What he means is that Christian believers must be absolutely certain of what they hope for and what they do not yet see. He testifies how their ancestors maintained strong faith in the face of struggle. Particularly, he tells them to emulate Abraham, who took God at his word and in obedience to God acted on his commands and who saw himself as a pilgrim on earth, patiently looking forward to the promised land. Then the writer compares Christian life to running a race, which requires focus, consistency, discipline and faith to reach the finish line. He sets out reasons for cheerfully bearing all afflictions and hardships that come their way. He tells them that their faith in Christ has not to reach the point of death or shedding blood. Therefore, he encourages them to look up to many great saints of the past for inspiration, courage, strength and endurance to bear their suffering to the end. He also reminds them that their suffering, including the suffering of saints, is so insignificant compared with the suffering of Jesus. Then the writer gives them another reason to persevere in their faith. He urges them to embrace suffering as a kind of discipline for their own ultimate good. In other words, Christians are called upon to regard suffering as an expression of God's love and a way to make them better persons on earth, and so that one day they will be able to share in God's holiness and joy in heaven. Therefore, he instructs them to accept all forms of discipline with obedience, love, joy and hope. In today's text, the writer gives the Jewish Christians yet another reason to remain steadfast in their faith. He makes a contrast between two mountains both of which the Jewish Christians are certainly familiar with because mountains have played an important part in God's interaction with his people. We see many instances of people encountering God on mountains throughout scripture. One of the mountains the writer talks about in today's text is Mount Sinai. Even though the name of the mountain is not directly mentioned in the text. The description of the event obviously refers to Mount Sinai on which God gave the Ten Commandments and forged a covenant 
with his people through Moses. The writer recalls the God experience of their ancestors on the mountain. According to the book of Exodus, Moses first sees a burning bush, goes over to investigate, and then hears the thundering voice of God warning him not to come any closer, but to take off his sandals instead, for the place where he is standing is holy ground. Sometime later, when Moses goes to receive the Ten Commandments, all the people see darkness and smoke surrounding Mount Sinai, while terrible lightning strikes. And in the midst of the roaring thunder through the rocky mountain, they hear the commands of God. They are so afraid of the voice that they do not want any further word from Him. The whole event is designed by God to give the people a sense of awe and wonder of Himself. The voice reveals to them that He is God and He is powerful, whereas they are just His subjects. The encounter reveals the sheer majesty, absolute unapproachability and terror of God. The other mountain the writer refers to is Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the mountain on which much of the city of Jerusalem has been built and where God makes the new covenant with people through Jesus Christ. Mount Zion is the promised land or heavenly home which Abraham had looked forward to. From this mountain Christ reigns and extends his grace and mercy to the whole human race. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in Jerusalem stands as a symbol of God's unfailing love and unchanging forgiveness. So the writer makes the comparison between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion and instructs the Jewish Christians who are under pressure to give up their faith in Jesus and return to their former belief, Judaism. He warns them of the danger awaiting them if they turn back. Going back to Mount Sinai would mean going back to the former belief. In other words, their relationship with God depends on their observance of the commandments. That approach would lead them to fear like their ancestors did at Mount Sinai. Instead, he encourages them to remain at Zion, the mountain of faith, the mountain of grace where God has led them. He also declares to them the wonderful blessings and gifts that belong to them because of faith. One, they have a place in heaven. Two, they are with thousands of angels and saints. Three, their names are recorded as members of the church of the firstborn in heaven. Four, they are cleansed of all their sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. Five, they have come not to the God of terror and revenge, but God of love and mercy. What is the message for us? Many of us are perhaps under pressure from today's world to think that we can meet the God of Mount Sinai with our observance of His commandments alone. How many of us can courageously stand before Him and face His wrath or judgment? Let us imagine the scene at Mount Sinai. I feel it is quite intimidating. If God asks us whether we are truly following or have followed His commandments, what would be our answers? Thou shall not have other gods before me. We may be expressing our belief in one God 
at Holy Mass and denying our own proclamation to non-believers and accept their gods as well. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. We may be declaring our love for the Lord and His name loudly hundreds of thousands of times in our worship and yet lacking respect for the same Lord and His name countless times by uttering, Oh my God! Oh Jesus! Jesus Christ! Then we are frustrated, irritated and afraid or deliberately ridiculing the name of God and all He stands for. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We may be unfailingly participating at Holy Mass for an hour on the Sabbath day and making unholy comments and alliances the rest of the day and week. Honor thy father and mother. We may be expressing our love for our parents on special occasions and ignoring or abandoning them at other times. Thou shall not kill. We may be causing death to people in so many ways. Thou shall not commit adultery. You may be unfaithful to your commitment in your thoughts, words and actions. You in your marital vows, and I in my religious and priestly vows. Thou shall not steal. We may be acquiring many goods and things that duly belong to others. Thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We may be involved in slander, gossip, rumors, backbiting, and tail-bearing through the modern means of communication. Thou shalt not covet. We may be filled with envy and greed to covet what others have. Friends, we will find ourselves unworthy to claim salvation or heaven or peace or joy just by following of God's commandments or being good. Therefore, we are encouraged to seek Mount Zion or Jerusalem. Today, for Christians, Zion refers not to the place but Jesus Christ himself, only in, through and by whom we can meet God. In baptism, we, together with all saints and angels, have become the family of God. We have access to our Lord and Saviour, especially in a mysterious way in the Holy Eucharist. As we recall the love of God manifested through His Son Jesus Christ on the cross, we can experience and almost touch and feel everlasting peace and joy as grace and mercy flow from the altar of the Lord. Whether you are a new convert to our faith or a long time struggling Christian, let us not go back to our former beliefs, ways and practices. Instead, let us remain or come to Jesus to find rest for our mind and body and peace for our soul. Teaching from the past four weeks. First, let our faith be like that of Abraham. Second, let us persevere in our Christian life despite obstacles like running a race. Third, let us accept all forms of discipline from God with obedience, love, joy and hope. Fourth, let us go to Jesus and find rest. Amen. God bless you.